So again, we're in this book, The Prophet Noble Drew Ali and the Moorish Science Temple of America. Again, same author. Just uh, This is the actual, I believe, uh, thesis. He uh, typewrited it. All right, so we're going to go to page uh, seven real quick. Uh, what are the abstract? And it says, Noble Prophet Noble Drulis, a brief history by Herbert H. Booker II. Because there's some things in here he says that he leaves out in the other one. It says, In the late 19th century, African American intellectuals became increasingly critical of European American Christians for supporting racial segregation here in America and co colonialism in Africa. European Americans, they charged, were in danger of turning Christianity into a white man's religion. Timothy Drew, 1886 to 1929, an African-American religious leader, came forward to offer African-Americans an alternative to Christianity. All right, an alternative. Because he felt that Christianity was a religion for European-Americans and that the true religion for African-Americans was Islam. Was Islam. So why did he use Christian writings? Right? In his book, that he wrote as, 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 as kind of his Bible, right? In 1913, Timothy Drew, Noble Drew Ali, as his followers called him, founded the first non-Christian temple in Newark, New Jersey. According to Drew Ali, knowledge of self was the key to salvation, and he had been sent by Allah to restore African Americans to their true identity, which had been stolen from them by European American Christians. Says in 1925, Drew Ali moved to his headquarters in Chicago, Illinois. In 1927, Drew Ali published the Holy Quran of the Moorish Temple of Science, which was known as the Circle 7 Quran because it bore on its cover a number 7 inside a circle. This Quran is not to be confused with the Holy Quran of the Orthodox Muslims. Drew Ali's Quran is a pamphlet of 64 pages. This book alone with the Holy Bible. This book alone with the Holy Bible was used by Drew Ali's followers as a reference to daily living. So they still read the Bible. They still read the Bible, you know. All right. So isn't the Christians reading the Bible? Isn't Hebrews reading the Bible too? Like, so I thought it wasn't about religion. So these people, along with the Holy Quran, who's, who had a lot of Christian references and New Age Aquarian uh, references to Jesus, right was read by his followers as long with the bible so they didn't let go of any religion all right drew ali died in chicago illinois in 1929 under mysterious circumstances the moorish science temple of america split into several factions so he died under mysterious circumstances again again mysterious this was in first um, this was the first american religious organization to spread awareness of islam as an alternative to Christianity for African Americans. So listen, again, he's telling you straight up that this was the first American religious organization to spread the awareness of Islam. This is before the nation of Islam, right? He was the first. This study is intended to shed new light on the life and teachings of Drew Ali by providing information previously unavailable. The following will be examined. A brief history of Moore County in North Carolina Moore County and the tribe of Ben Ishmael it says point two Drew Ali's early years point three his assumption of prophethood point four a history of the Moorish Science Temple of America point five the mysterious circumstances surrounding his death all right now it says here in the introduction the purpose of this thesis is to explore the history of the prophet Noah Drew Ali the development of the Moorish Science Temple of America herein after referred to as MSTA and the other organizations he influenced. Drew Ali has a unique position as a religious leader in the rich and diverse history of African Americans who influenced other African American religious leaders, dodged the hijack with the whole African thing, including Father Divine. Listen to this. He influenced, all right, listen, who he influenced. Father Divine, W.D. Fard, yes, you know, the pale guy, W.D. Fard, Elijah Muhammad and others have been well documented. He influenced these people, the whole nation of Islam and all that. In a photograph in Sacred Drift, Essays on the Margin of Islam by Peter Lamborn Wilson, Drew Ali is shown wearing a turban fez with a feather in it and in, in a robe with a sash above his chest. 
not unlike the custom of Freemasons, just like a Freemason. All right. Drew Ali dressed just like a Freemason. Remember, he was initiated to a secret society by that uh, high priest from an ancient cult in Egypt. Let's not forget that, right? Drew Ali had access to certain, certain information that we didn't have access to. So he knew who he was. He knew who he was or who he thought he was because he had some information from somebody, right? This gave him the appearance of a character in a comic opera. Like Marcus M. Garvey, Drew Ali was in many ways a product of his time, and it is difficult to understand him without looking at the interplay of the social dislocation that produced the atmosphere in which he and Garvey flourished. No matter what Drew Ali was to the establishment who did not take him seriously, to his followers who found new life and lived again, stimulated by his presence and credos, he was taken seriously. He was their prophet and a leader of great significance to them. Now, further down in this book, all right, page five, it says, Marcus M. Garvey and Drew Ali shared in the leadership of African Americans. They shared, utilizing different approaches. In fact, many of Garvey's former supporters were leaders in the Moore Science Temple of America. Did you know that? Marcus Garvey, many of his leadership so many of Marcus Garvey's supporters were leaders in the Morris Science Temples of America. Drew Ali's movement had its major theological documents, the Holy Bible and the seven, Circle 7 Quran. The latter is a modification of the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus the Christ of the PC and Age. You see this? Why are they saying all this? I'm going to show you what's in it. All right, You're going to see Jesus all over it. I'm not kidding. All right, so this person's letting you straight up know. All right, look up that book or that gospel, the Korean gospel of Jesus, the Christ of the Peace and Age. I think I actually had that book before. This was way back in the New Age teachings, right? When, the, when we had no access to real info, when the internet first just came out. Just like there's random websites all over the place, crazy information, no sources, right? New Age stuff by levi h dowling and says that he just copied that basically that's what it is it's a later modification of this that's basically what it is this is a collection of apocryphal books of the holy bible which could not be verified for their authenticity and authorship as well as garvey's philosophy all right according to peter lamborn wilson he said the circle seven quran must be considered a modern apocryphon the specific sources of ancient apocrypha and pseudopigrapha are largely unknown, but we can actually trace the genesis of Drew Ali's Quran. About half of it, right, is taken from the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus, the Christ of the Peace and Age. Half of Drew Ali, who's supposed to be Islam, the Moors, who have nothing to do with religion, supposedly, right? Half of their prophets, their founder. A book is from the Aquarian Gospel of Jesus, the Christ of the Peace and Age by Levi H. Dowling of Ohio, 1908. A still popular account of Christ's sojourn in India from adolescence to age 30 during the Gospel's lost years. Liberal and mystical, theosophical in tone, the Aquarian Gospel, which Dowling said was revealed to him out of the Akashic Records. They told you we're getting to the Blavatsky and all these people. It turns over, it turned owes its inspiration to La Vie Inconnue de Jesus by Nicholas Notovich, 1894, a Russian Jew converted to Orthodoxy. Both leaders, Marcus M. Garvey and Drew Ali, gave many African Americans a sense of pride in their race, history, and cultural identity, and validation of their hum humanity within the context of living as African Americans. Garvey gave African Americans a sense of nationhood. Drew Ali believed that if African Americans could establish an identity with Asian people, they could be likely hurt than being African Americans. Drew Ali became obsessed with the idea that salvation for African Americans lay in reclaiming their na national origin. He refused, therefore, to use the terms Negroes, Black, Folk, Colored People, or Ethiopians. His followers called themselves Asiatics, or more specifically, Moors or Moorish Americans. All right, so you're going to call yourself Asiatic? 
Is that what you're doing today? You're calling yourself Asiatic when you know you're from a tribe here in America. You're calling yourself Asiatic, or more specifically, a more Moorish, more more by Canaanite. Is that what you're calling yourself today? Hugo P. Lehman said, "Out of the wreck of the Garvey movement, there sprang Phoenix-like, the Moorish American cult of which the Prophet was Drew Ali." After this prophet's disappearance and the destabilization of the movement as a formally organized denomination, there sprang up the Nation of Islam. Peter Lambert Wilson said that the Circle 7 Quran mentions Marcus M. Garvey as the forerunner of Drew Ali's. Some say he was Drew Ali's cousin, as John the Baptist was the cousin of Jesus. And Moorish science is generally regarded as an offshot of Garveyism. As an offshot of Garvey is um, all right you dig on that Wilson stated socially and politically this is true but does little to explain the Islamic ingredients of Moorish science some scholars mention Ahmadiyya missionaries but I find the hypothesis unconvincing the Ahmadiyyas are very orthopractic despite their heresies and would at least have introduced the Islamic Quran as they apparently did later with the Nation of Islam. Arthur Huff Fawcett stated, when the initiate becomes a full member of the cult, he's talking about the Moorish science temple, that's how he's calling it a cult, you know, Dash the hijack, but you know, in his eyes it was a cult. He was given a card, slightly larger than a calling card, which bore the following inscription. So it says, replica or star and crescent of Islam, says unity replica of the clasp hands and says replica of the circle seven Allah this is your nationality and identification card for the Moorish Science Temple of America and birthrights for the Moorish Americans etc we honor the divine prophets Jesus Muhammad Buddha and Confucius may the blessings of God and our father Allah be upon you that carry this card so wait a minute may the blessings of God and our father Allah so it's not the same. What do you mean? There's two gods here. What's going on? Upon that, carry this card. I do hereby declare that you are a Muslim under the divine lines of the Holy Quran. Uh, Sikh of Mecca, love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice. I am a citizen of the USA. All right. So I mean, you're a citizen of the USA of the corporation. You see how it's in capital. All right. You're a citizen now. Of USA, or are you an Aboriginal of America? Amarukan? All right, so we're back in this uh, complete book of the Noble Dri Ali and the Moorish Science Temple Movement. Again, uh, by Herbert H. Booker. This was his thesis in college, right? And he has another name which he goes by, which is Bay at the end. All right, we're going to go back um, to page 12. And it says here, the Prophet Noble Dri Ali, an overview. 
In 1913, the noble Drew Ali established the Moorish Science Temple in Newark, New Jersey, and began teaching a synthesized version of Orthodox Islam, Garveyism, Christianity, and various extractions from Oriental philosophy, including the mysticism of the Islamic Sufis. All right, we're gonna go into this more. All right, I'm gonna show you how deep this goes. All right, I know a lot of you are saying, well, he's just reading this book from this guy. Don't worry. We're gonna get it from his own words. We're gonna get it uh, a more uh, factual history, you know, something, you know, that can cor corroborate uh, with other things, right? And again, so it's telling you that, you know, it was a version of Islam, right? Uh, the thing, teachings of Garvey, Marcus Garvey, Christianity, you're gonna see Jesus all over his book, uh, his Quran Bible that he made, the Circle Seven, and various extractions, again, from the philosophy, including mysticism, all right? This is the same people or the same teachings that eventually became known under Blavatsky. And yes, I'm gonna say Aleister Crowley. Yeah, this was the same people. They said that, you know, they went and learned from Egyptian adepts. And so we got this on the other video already in the other part of the, this series, how Drew Ali was sent over to uh, Egypt. Um, we, even in the Moorish history, you know, you go all over their websites and everything, they'll tell you that uh, his history supposedly is that he was with gypsies, then they he went with them over to Egypt. And, you know, he came back the noble Drew Ali and added, all right, very high uh, initiate. All right, so we're, this isn't too far from the truth, all right. Now he says here, his ideas and philosophy provided a foundation for early African-American identification with Africa, with Africa, as a positive source of self-development and self-realization. For the noble Drew Ali, this heritage was most closely identified with the Moroccans of North Africa. All right? These are the Berbers, the Almoravids, the descendants of Goliath, the people from Canaan, they got kicked out by Joshua. Is that what he's talking about? Let's not forget. The noble Drew Ali was able to attract thousands of African Americans because of the mixing of religion, nationalism, race pride, and his simplicity of doctrine. All right, mixing of religion. The main contentions of the noble Drew Ali's religious nationalism are as follows. The key to the salvation and liberation of African peoples in the United States lay in the discovery and acceptance of their true national origin as Moors. The religion of Islam was the only instrument for African American unity, solidarity, and advancement. Whites were negative and soon to be destroyed by Allah. African Americans needed to be law abiding and to refrain from radicalism the noble drew ali urged his followers to struggle to be righteous and to build a better world for all humanity and he encouraged love harmony and peace in the world especially among african americans when the noble drew ali left newark or chicago in 1925 the reason he gave was he believed that the midwest was closer to islam all right he might have been referring to the Egyptian Shriners. You see that? So there is, I'm going to show you this in other correlation. I don't know how many videos is going to take me, but you know, I hope you are patient with me. All right. I'm going to show you, you know, many sources, there's many stories that, you know, really don't get discussed. Many things that, you know, people are leaving out, you know, and uh, not correlating. All right. So uh, again, it says that he went to Chicago for a specific reason because it was closer to Islam. And the dude's telling you straight up, he was referring to the Shriners, the Adams, the secret schools that were there. So again, he might have been referring to the Egyptian Shriners, but also might have meant the Ishmaels or both. The Ishmaels, that's what I'm talking about. Who's these tribe of Ishmaels? It was said that the Ishmaelites were among the first converts of the noble Drew Ali in Chicago. All right, who? The Ishmaelites, who are these Ishmaelites? We're gonna get into that, all right? Just have patience with me. Just bear with me. It's gonna be a little journey, all right? The first converse of the Noble Drew Ali in Chicago. While in Chicago, the movement was disrupted by the appearance of a Russo-Syrian peddler of silks and raincoats by the name of Abdul Wali Barad Muhammad Ali. All right, you hear this? We're gonna get also inside story 
to this character who is said to be the same as WD Fard of the Nation of Islam. All right, that says he was a Russo, Russo Russ, you know, get the drop from Khan drop, Russo Syrian peddler of silks and raincoats by the name of Abdul Wali Farad Muhammad Ali, who began luring some of the Moors away to his own brand of Islam. Seems WD Fard has a long history here with um, the whole Moor Science Temple. The noble Drew Ali commented that there was a blue-eyed devil who was now stealing his followers. This was the same man who eventually split the Moor Science Movement and convinced Elijah Muhammad to join him in establishing a new organization, the Nation of Islam. All right. But you see, there's something connection here with Noble Drew Ali, right? They try to say there's not, but Barakhan said something in 2014 in one of his speeches, right? Talking about Noble Drew Ali, check it out, in his Savior's Day speech. And the Moors Science Temple entered its golden age. Nonetheless, Chicago proved far more hospitable than Newark. And more Science Temple entered its golden age. So he went from Newark, New Jersey, right? Remember, he had the Canaanite Temple, the Canaanite Temple, and then he went to Chicago. All right. It was officially incorporated in 1928, the same year the noble Drew Ali inaugurated Unity Hall. In 1929. All right. So now um, we're actually in the uh, book that noble Drew Ali, noble Drew Ali, you know wrote the Bible, the well, his Quran, the Holy Quran of the Moorish Holy Temple of Science, divinely prepared by the noble prophet Juali, by the guiding of his father God Allah, the great God of the universe, to redeem man from his sinful and fallen stage of humanity back to the highest plane of life, his father God Allah, all right? So it says, know thyself in Allah, the genealogy of Jesus? Say, what? The genealogy of Jesus, life and works of Jesus in India, Europe, and Africa, in the land of Egypt. All right, those are New Age, uh, Aquarian Age uh, readings, gospel book, all right, teachings. All right, so that's from the Holy Prophet. All right, that's him. His Mason turban, right? Remember, they broke it down for us. Noble Drew Ali, the prophet and founder of the Moorish Holy Temple of Science, to redeem the people from their sinful ways. From their sinful ways. All right, and this is Sultan Abdul Abziz Ibu Suwa, the descendant of Hagar. Hagar, now the head of the holy city of Mecca. All right, Hagar, who was Hagar? One of Abraham's wives, a slave or a servant he had, concubine. And I believe Ishmael came out of that. So he's a descendant of that. It says, all right. And so his book starts with Know Thyself and Thy Father God Allah. The genealogy of Jesus with 18 years of the events, life and works teaching in India, Europe and Africa. These events occurred before he was 30 years of age. These secret lessons are for all those who love Jesus and desire to know about his life, works and teachings. So Jesus, all about Jesus, right? Now... Noble Drulli says the industrious acts. So let's zoom into this. All right, let me go back. It says the industrious acts of the Muslims of Northwest and Southwest Africa. These are the Moabites, Hamites, Canaanites who were driven out of the land of Canaan by Joshua. What? So Noble Drulli remembers. So you thought it was Sheikh Way El who's just saying that, making that up. He's quoting Noble Drew Ali. Noble Drew Ali is letting you know. That the industrious acts of the Muslims of Northwest and Southwest Africa, remember that was Amexum America, um, Al Marok, according to the Moors. These are the Moabites. So you are in Moabite, you're a Hamite and Canaanite only. What about Shem and Japheth's kids and his lineage who were driven out of the land of Canaan, America by Joshua? So where's Joshua's people in, uh, in all this? So I thought everybody was a Moabite or a Moor. So what about Joshua's family or Quetzalcoatl's family, Jahawashi, who drove you out of Canaan? And then what happened? All these people, Moabites, Hamites, Canaanites, had to receive permission from the Pharaoh of Egypt to settle in that portion of Egypt. In later years, they formed themselves kingdoms. These kingdoms are called to this day Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli, etc. All right. These are the descendants 
They became Morocco, Algiers, Tunis, Tripoli. All right, Libya, North Africa. Yeah. All right, man. So who's this fella right here? Who's this suspicious fella? Who's this funny character right here? What's he doing to this person? It says Shadow of the Moabite. 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 Shadow of the Moabite. Look at this. Who did this? It says By a seer, the Duke of Tears, Shadow of the Moabite. A seer, the Duke of Tears, Shadow of the Moabite. Look at this. It says The Moabite nation was an ancient power in the old world that was comprised of the nations of the Hamites, Amorites, Hittites, and Canaanites. Well, thank you, Asir, for agreeing with what I'm saying. But we're not all Amorites or Hamites and Hittites and Canaanites, so how can you say we're all Moors? If that's what a Moor is, a Moabite nation. All right? Altogether, they were referred to as the Moabites. Altogether, they referred to as the Moabites. Together, he's saying. So these people together are called the Moabites oh we have a better understanding now thanks who asked permission of the pharaohs Montauk of Egypt northwest and southwest of Maxim to establish kingdoms can we settle there why did if it's yours why do you have to ask permission if it's not if it's yours so I thought you were here since way back why you gotta ask for permission these later became known as Morocco Hamatites all right Hamatites Algiers Amorites Tunis Hittites and Trump Tripolitania Canaanites. All right. The Moors of Marikanus, America, are the genetic remnants of the antediluvian world. Talking about the Atlanteans. This treatise gets into who these people really were as compared to who we re were taught they were. Enjoy. All right. So, Shadow of the Moabite. 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 Shadow. A shadow of the Moabite. Ha 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 ha. Look at this guy. Be careful with the Moabite. I see the Duke of Tears. All right, so now we're in this article. Uh, it's called Biography of the Moors by Brother Claudus M.L. from the Moorish Holy Temple. And he says, the Moors, founders of the first permanent civilization of the old world. The Moors, descendant of the ancient Moabites. Moabites, so you're a Moabite? Uh, the Moors were at the root of civilization. They were the founders and the master builders of the present holy city of Mecca, located in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia, the ancient Moabites were a people always on the move. They received permission from the pharaohs of Egypt in ancient times to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa, America today, according to them, right? They were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan empire. All right, so why did they have to receive permission from pharaohs of Egypt if it's America? What are they telling you straight up what we've been telling you along what we know? Tamari, ancient Egypt is in America. All right, so this part of history I don't disagree with. I know this is the true old world. All right, you just can't hijack the whole narrative. You can't generalize like everybody was this. So many nations were here and peoples. All right, the historical events took place long before the great earthquake which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. When the great city of Atlantis stood where the Atlantic Ocean stands today, when the ancient Moabites used to trade and transport with their brothers in the surrounding kingdoms, these historic events took place long before Europe was even thought about. It says religion, the religion of the ancient Moabites, followed was the Islamic faith. The Moabites' Islamic faith? Hmm. It's kind of weird the oldest in the world a muslim faith which came from the heart of allah the moors were responsible for the art science and mathematics which the world owes its step to today all right the, the reason i say it's kind of weird did uh islam exist as a religion right during the moabite era like the ancient moabites of the bible maybe right the quran the holy quran of the moorish holy temple of science divinely prepared by the noble prophet Juali. It says here, chapter one, the creation and fall of man. All right. 
and it goes on right there and right, we're not going to read all this book the education of mary and elizabeth and so on in egypt all right so these are apocryphal re uh, teachings you know i have actually this is from the aquarian the aquarian gospel of jesus christ the pcn age of the pcn age i had that book a long time ago when i was into the whole new age thing because there was no info out there no internet and i didn't have no uh ties with no secret society so adepts or you know who had high degrees of knowledge you know teaching stuff like this all right but i'm glad i did because then i might have been influenced some way all right so i was able to look into my own research right it says elihu's lessons in unity of life right so i'm not going to go through the whole thing i'm just going to get to the parts i want to show you real quick just another example says chapter five after the feast the homeward journey the missing jesus the search for him his parents find him in the temple he goes with them to nazareth symbolic meaning of a carpenter's tools the grand architect a mason all right so it's all about jesus right so again more chapter six life and works of jesus in india among the muslims all right even in india jesus all right we got that account in the aquarian age books it says chapter seven the friendship of jesus and lamas jesus explains to lamas the meaning of truth all right jesus going all over the world this jesus Remember, this is a Canaanite Jesus. This is not the same Jesus as a Christian Jesus, because this is a, according to uh, Noah Drolli, he's a Can Canaanite, all right? Jesus reveals to the people their sinful ways. So did you know that the Holy Quran of uh, the Moral Science Temple had a bunch of Jesus teachings in it, like New Age, Aquarian Age teachings of Jesus in it? Chapter 10, Jesus spake unto the unity of Allah and man to the Hindus. All right, so Jesus is all over the place again. All right. Chapter 13, life and works of Jesus in Egypt among the Gentiles. It says Jesus was Elihu and Solomon in Egypt, tells the story of his journeys. Elihu and Solomon praise Allah. Jesus goes to the temple in Heliopolis and is received as a pupil. Heliopolis, where they worship Thoth, the city of Thoth. He was the, he was the grand god there. Remember my Thoth videos, right? So also the place where supposedly where mary went to hide with baby jesus and heliopolis hmm Thoth's uh sacred place chapter 15 divine ministry of jesus jesus goes to the wilderness for self-examination where he remains 40 days is subject to three temptations he overcomes returns to the camps of john and begins his teachings this is like the new testament all right all right this is chapter 17 and this one's interesting it says jesus appears fully materialized before apollo in the silent brotherhood in greece appears to claudius and juliet on tiber near rome appears to the priest in the egyptian temple at helopolis so apollo with the silent brotherhood of greece was sitting in delphine grove the oracle had spoken loud and long the priests were in the sanctuary of they looked the, they, they looked the oracle became a blaze of light it seemed to be on fire and all consumed the priests were filled with fear they said a great disaster is to come our gods are mad they have destroyed our oracle but when the flames had spent themselves a man stood on the oracle pedestal and Allah speaks to man not by an oracle of wood and gold but by the voice of man the gods have spoken to the Greeks in kindred tongues through image made by man but Allah the one now speaks to man through Jesus the only son who was and is and evermore will be this oracle will fail the living oracle of Allah the one will not fail Apollo knew the man who spoke he knew it was the Nazarene who once had taught the wise man in the Acropolis and had rebuked the idol worshippers upon the Athens uh, beach and in a moment Jesus stood before Apollo and the signing brotherhood and said behold for I have risen from the dead with gifts for men I bring to you the title of your past estate all right so check out what drew ali's letting us know this is what drew ali wrote in his holy quran all right i mean how do you in interpret all this you got jesus then you got him talking to greeks apollo right chapter 19 jesus appears fully materialized to the eastern sages in the palace of prince ravana in india to the magician priest in Persia, three wise men speak in praise of the personality of the Nazarini, Nazarini, Nazi, Nazarini. Wow, Ravana, Prince of India. All right, so yeah, so you can see uh, Jesus still all over this book. I'm um, in chapter 19. All right, so once we get to chapter 20, all right, 
So it starts talking about other stuff. So it says holy instruction and warnings for all young men. Then it gives us marriage, right? Advice on marriage and all that. And then duty of husband. All right, so it gives a lot of lessons. And then I want to get to another specific part. So way uh, all the way ahead in this book, almost at the end, in this chapter, it says the divine origin of the Asiatic nations. All right? So it's not just Sheikh Wei El that was saying this. I don't even know what you guys were arguing about Sheikh Wei El. Because he was just, I mean, he didn't say nothing about himself. Nothing was his opinion. He was just breaking down different scholars at work. So either way, it says here, the fallen sons and daughters of the Asiatic nation of North America need to learn to love instead of hate and to know of his higher self and lower self. This is the uniting of the Holy Quran of Mecca, of Mecca, for teaching and instructing of all Moorish Americans, etc. The key of civilization was and in the hands of the Asiatic nations, the Moorish who were the ancient Moabites, Moabite, Moabite, the Moorish who were the ancient Moabite, Moabite, and the founders of the holy city of Mecca, the Moabites. All right. Number three. This is what every. This is what he's telling you. All right. Point one. Point two. Now point three. The Egyptians who were the Hamites and of a direct descent of Mizraim and the Arabians, the seed of Hagar, Japanese and Chinese. All right. You see that? The Egyptians, Hamites, these are all Canaanites, even the Japanese, the ab original, the aboriginal Japanese and Chinese, all those Negro Asiatics, these were Hamites. These were Hamites. The same people migrated over to Africa eventually. Copper Hot stepping, you know, them, the Kono Empire have been breaking this down. They made a great video once to build life and broke that down how many of these tribes originated in Asia and they're in Africa today. These very dark skinned tribes that you would never imagine came from Asia or the Middle East, but they did. And they settled in Africa and they can trace it back to them. They're chiefs. All right, now it says the Hindus of India. Remember, don't leave out the Hindus of India, the Hindustan, you mean Hindustan, not India, the descendants of the ancient Canaanites, Hittites and Moabites from the land of Canaan. The Hindus are Moabites. So even the Hindus are Moabites. You're related to the Hindus too, the Moors, the Asiatic nations and countries in North, South and Central America. The Moorish Americans and Mexicans in North America, Brazilians, Argentinians, and Chileans in South America. So they're saying that all the people over here too are Moors. They're Asian though. You're saying they're Asiatic. So how are they Asiatic? But they're here. See, they're still going with the out of Asia or whatever, whatever out of Africa, out of Asia theory. You know, how could you be from two places? You understand what he's saying? It says Colombians, Nicaraguans. Nicaraguans, that's like my neighbors and the natives of San Salvador in Central America are all these are Muslims. We're all Muslims. So everybody in Central America is Muslims. Like seriously, my 13th great grandfather is Chief Garabito. He wasn't no Muslim. He wasn't no Muslim. The Turks are the true descendants of Hagar. Listen to this, the Turks are the descendants of Hagar, one of Abraham's concubines, all right, who are the chief protectors of the Islamic creed of Mecca, beginning from Muhammad, the first, the founder of the uniting of Islam by the command of the great universal God. All right, so he broke down, if you're calling yourself a Moor, this is who you are, all right, and um, you got dodged the hijack in a lot of this. Further down, it says Egypt. The capital empire of the dominion of Africa it says the inhabitants of Africa are the descendants of the ancient Canaanites from the land of Canaan. All right. You, if you're in Africa, right, they're telling you straight up that the, those people are the, from the land of Canaan, meaning America. You originated in America. That's the true old world. It's letting you know. Drew Ali knows the drop on that. We don't agree, disagree on that. Now it says... But you're from the old man Kush. Kush is from Canaan, which is from Ham, a Hamite. All right? That portion of humanity. 
So Old Man Kush and his family are the first inhabitants of Africa who came from the land of Canaan or America. His father Ham and his family was second. His father came later. Then came the word Ethiopia. Oh, which means the demarcation line of the dominion of Amexem, the first true and divine name of Africa. You see this? The dividing of the land between the father and the son. You see what the letting you know? That one portion was for him and the other was for Kush or Canaan. What about Shem and Japheth's people? They don't get a lot. Only Ham and Canaan get a lot. Now let me show you. So it says the dominions of Kush, Northeast and Southeast Africa, right? And Northwest and Southwest was his father's dominion of Africa. So they're saying that Ham had Northwest or Southwest, which was America. Remember they showed us the map and the other uh, article we saw earlier with a Maxim, right? So they're saying that that part of the world was Ham and Africa and all that was Kush. So what about Shem and Japheth? Where's their lot? All right. In the later years, many of their brethren from Asia and the Holy Lands joined them. All right, so it says the Moabites from the land of Moab, Moabite from the land of Moab, Moab, Utah. Is that where you settled? You asked permission from Pharaoh, settled in Moab, Utah, who received permission from the Pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa. They were the founders and are the true possessors of the present Moroccan Empire. They are the true founders of the present Moroccan Empire with their Canaanite, their Canaanites, Hittites, and Amorites, Amorite brethren who sojourned from the land of Canaan seeking new homes. They had to take, why were they seeking new homes again? Because Joshua had drove them out, right? From the land of Canaan or the promised land. This was Shem's land. It wasn't the land of Canaan. He settled there when he wasn't supposed to. That wasn't his lot. That's why they had to seek new homes because it got to the rightful owners by lot, by contract, all right? So the Moabites, they got together with their Canaanite, Hittite, Amorite brethren, all right, from the land of Canaan, seeking new homes, all right? Their dominion and inhabitation extended from Northeast and Southwest Africa across the great Atlantis. Yeah, what did you guys do in Atlantis? Isn't thought from Atlantis, thought the Atlantean, even unto the present North, South, and Central America, and also Mexico. Even there, yeah, you guys were here in the in, in our in the land of Canaan, Mexico, and Atlantis islands before the great earthquake, which caused the great Atlantic Ocean. Now listen to what he says here. It says the river now was drudged and made by the ancient pharaohs of Egypt. All right. So the river over there in Africa, like the one over there called the Nile, was drushed. Dreshed or drushed mean it was made bigger. They kind of dug it out. So they made that as artificial. Are you saying that's artificial? Because the Mississippi is not artificial. The Mississippi is definitely not artificial. All right. So it was drushed by the made by the ancient pharaohs of Egypt in order to trade with the surrounding kingdoms. Also, the Niger River was drushed by the great pharaoh of Egypt. Also, that one's artificial those ancient days for trade and it extends eastward from the river now westward across the great atlantis it was used for trade and transportation according to all true and divine records of the human race there is no negro black or colored race attached to the human family because all the inhabitants of africa africa not america africa were and are of the human race pan-african right descendants of the ancient canaanite nation from the holy land of canaan you're not from Africa because you came from America. What your ancient forefathers were, you are without a doubt of contradiction. All right, so that is Noble Drusalis, you know, I guess, history of the races, I guess, you know, and uh, it's just, I, all I see is one perspective, honestly. And uh, there's always two sides to every story, right? So, you know, that was mostly what, you know, I wanted to show you from this book, all right? At the end times, the fulfillment of the prophecies, all right, John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus, all right, the Marcus Garvey, I guess was saying that Noble G was going to come as a prophet, that's what they're saying, Marcus Garvey out of Africa, let's go back to Africa, Marcus Garvey, yeah, there's something going on here, they're both Masons, yeah, there's something definitely going on here, all right, it's, I think you think it's cool to just be a Freemason and be in secret societies and all that, and it's okay, and you know, yeah, all right, you know, but um, it's all right, you know, you, you, just don't force all this on everybody and don't generalize because we, we are independent researchers. So 
when you come over here and tell us something, you know, we're going to research it, all right? It says the fine sons of daughters of Asian nation of North America need Asiatic nation, Asiatic, so they're Asiatic, need to learn to love instead of hate and to know his higher self and lower self. Stop loving, man. Stop hating, man. You need to stop loving. Stop hating more. More bite. Asiatic. If you're from Morocco and you're all that side in Africa and all that in Canada, then I guess you are Asiatic. This is the United of the Holy Quran of Mecca. It says, for the strength of the old Moorish Americans. All right. So this is the Holy Quran of the Moorish Holy Science Temple. Know yourself and your God, Allah. All right. That you may learn to love instead of hate. Every man needs to worship under his own vine and fig tree. That's That's true. The uniting of Asia. The uniting of Asia. Asia. Quran, Asia. Jesus. Man. All right. So I just wanted to show you the, this book so you can, in case you never come across it, you know. I have a lot of versions of this book. So, you know, you can see from Drew Ali's own words what he was teaching and what the people actually in these uh, more, early more science temples were. I remember they had the, the Holy Quran, this one, and they had the Bible to study. All right. So, he had clothing, he, he wore clothes like a Freemason, right? So they said about Noble Drew Ali. Well, you know, we know he actually went to Egypt and became initiated, right, into secret society. So, I mean, it's no lie, right? I mean, they, 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 they acknowledge it and say it's their ancient science first. So, Freemasonry, which is true, you know, that started with so-called black people, you know, we know that. So... This book is called The Craft and the Crescent. It says Freemasonry and the Black Muslim Movement in America by Michael S. Schneider. Schneider. All right. So it says Marcus Garvin, the United Negro Improvement Association, Noble Drolli in the Moorish Science Temple, Wallace D.F. and for part in the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad Minister, Louis Farrakhan, the Nuwabian Nation of Moors, Nation God's Severus, the Five Percenters. All right introduction of this book it says this paper sets out to show the influence of freemasonry in the nation of islam noi and the group leading up to the noi's formation and those who rose out of it these groups are created of necessity because of the unfavorable social atmosphere toward african americans in the united states at the beginning of the 20th century the groups that lead up to the nation of islam were the united negro improvement association led by uh, marcus garvey and the Moorish science temple Yes. You hear that? Again. The groups that led up to the Nation of Islam were the United Negro Improvement Association. And that was led by Marcus Garvey and the Moorish Science Temple founded by Noble Drew Ali in the legions. I will touch on each of these groups and show their relation to the Nation of Islam and the influence that these two groups had on W.D. Farr and Elijah Muhammad. The two men who are responsible for the creation of development of the NOI theology. All right, so I just wanted to show you this, all right? A lot of people say, no, it never happened. These two people never met or whatever, but. So we're at the New York Times here, right? And there's an article here from, I believe, 1920 or actually 1993. They were talking about something that had happened in 1920. So this is an article from May 22nd, 1993, section one, page 18. You can buy the original. It's right there, this little section right here. All right, I'm gonna read it to you. It's down here. Now it says, black Muslims enter Islamic mainstream, front page, May 3. Misses a key historical fact on the introduction of Islam in America. Now it says the Ahmadiyya movement in Islam, an Orthodox universal community was the first successful organized effort to introduce Islam in the United States and was most successful among African Americans or the Aboriginals, so-called African Americans. You're not an African about you. Check your genealogy. We already broke it down. You've been here. So it was successful among you. It was a whole movement to put this like doctrine into you. There was a whole movement from all the way in the other side of the world, all right? Missionaries were sent to America. Missionaries were sent to America by the al Madiya movement to propagate Islam. The first being Mulf, Mufti Muhammad Sadiq, who landed in America on February 15th, 1920. 
Mohammed Sadiq became close to the Universal Negro Improvement Association founded by Marcus Garvey. All right? And preached Islam to the Garveyites, whose members then included Elijah Muhammad and who? Noble Drew Ali. Elijah Muhammad and who? Noble Drew Ali. They were part of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. All right? So we go back to this book. It says that the group, right, the groups that led up to the Nation of Islam were the United Negro Improvement Association, led by Marcus Garvey and the Morris Science Temple, founded by Noble Drew Ali. All right, it's telling you straight up. All right, so we're in this website now, the Morris Science Temple, the Divine and National Movement of North America, the Morris American National Republic. All right. So is this from Shigwe L2? No, right? So it says the Prophet Noble Drew Ali and Marcus Garvey connection. All right, they knew each other. What do you mean they didn't know each other? In the early 1900s, there were many, many mighty men and master teachers around. Two of those great men were the Prophet Noble Drew Ali and Marcus Mosiah Garvey. By taking a look at the time period, it is clear to see that both these men clearly knew each other. And most likely, they knew each other before they started their individual movements. All right? Prophet's Noble Drew Ali started his Moorish movement in 1913. Marcus Garvey Jr. started his movement in 1914. It is clear that the Prophet Noble Drew Ali held Marcus Garvey in high regards because he allowed his, his name to be stated in the Moorish Holy Quran. It reads in chapter 48.13, The last prophet in these days is Noble Drew Ali, who was prepared divinely in due time by Allah to redeem men from their sinful ways and to warn them of the great wrath which is sure to come upon the earth. John the Baptist was the forerunner of Jesus in those days to warn and stir up the nation and prepare them to receive the divine creed, which was to be taught by Jesus, by Jesus. In these modern days, there came a forerunner of Jesus who was divinely prepared by great God Allah, and his name is Marcus Garvey, who did teach and warn the nations of the earth to prepare to meet the coming prophet, who was to bring the true and divine creed of Islam, and his name is Noble Drew Ali, who was prepared and sent to his earth by Allah. All right, so this is in the Moorish Holy Quran, chapter 48. That's uh, Noble Drew Ali giving himself credit. Like, hey, he wrote about me coming, all right? Now it says, today amongst Moorish Americans, Marcus Garvey is known as the forerunner of Prophet Noble Drew Ali, all right? So it talks about uh, Marcus Garvey, how he was born in Jamaica. And it says here, it is said that Deuce Muhammad Ali influenced, shaped Garvey's speeches and led him to organize the United Universal Negro Improvement Association. The UNIA in Jamaica in, 19, in 1914. It has been suggested that the UNIA motto, One God, One Aim, One Destiny, originated from Deuce Muhammad Ali's Islamic influence on Garvey. So, this is the dude he influenced, that influenced Garvey says. It says, Marcus Garvey appears to have learned many sciences, history, and spiritual science from Deuce Muhammad Ali, which would go well with the independent United Order of mechanic lessons he knew. The Independent United Order of Mechanics started in 1757 in England and spread to the United States, Central America, the Caribbean, the Netherlands, and Canada. The mechanics are associated with Freemasonry. All right. It's not a mechanic. Like, it's Freemasonry because of the similarities with the degrees. All right. Freemasons. These are all Freemasons. See what I'm showing you? Are you starting to overstand? Marcus Garvey then went on to establish many successful businesses because of his Freemasonry connections. Between 1919 and 1927, Marcus Garvey was charged and jailed in between that time pertaining to alleged mail fraud. In 1927, Prophet Noble Drew Ali went to visit Marcus Garvey in federal prison. A picture of the postcard Prophet Noble Drew Ali sent to his wife at the time speaks about that visit below. All right, so this is the postcard. There's also a newspaper which speaks about Pro Prophet Noble Drew Ali returning to Chicago and the visit with Marcus Garvey. So this is from a newspaper article, the Chicago Defender, it says here. The Chicago Defender, all right, um, November 19, 1927, I think it says there. 1921 to 1967, number 19, 1927, yeah. So it says, Noble Drew Ali returns after long visit. All right, let me see if I can. It says, Noble Drew Ali, prophet, founder, and head of the Moorish National Divine Movement, has returned to the city after an extended visit in the south. Prophet Ali, or motored 
from Chicago to Atlanta, Georgia, where he spent a few hours visiting Marcus Garvey. He visited Marcus Garvey. He knew Marcus Garvey. They talked together in the federal prison. Mr. Garvey was very much pleased with the splendid uplift work being done by the Moorish Divine Movement. He was happy with the Moorish Divine Movement of Noble Drew Ali. The organization has launched a drive for more members, persons, the series of learning of great work that is being done are asked to write Prophet Ali. And they give it 3603 Indiana Ave, Chicago. Phone. All right, so now we're in this uh, article from the University of California, Riverside. It says, Noble Drew Ali in the Moorish Science Temple, a study in race, gender, and African-American religion, 1913 to 1930. This is a dissertation submitted in partial satisfaction of the requirements for the degree of Doctor of Philosophy and History by Steph Stephanie Ann Wilms, August 2014. Doctor of Philosophy, Graduate Program in History, University of California, Riverside, August 2014. Dr. VP Franklin Chairperson. All right, and I want to go to a specific part that's talking about Drew Ali. Even though this uh, person gets into a lot of deep stuff, like it says, it takes into account of the influences Marcus Mosiah Garvey and the Universal Negro Improvement Association had on Morris science, the impact of Freemasonry and photography and the success and spread of Morris science photography, like advertisement, and the role of women within the early temple. All right. It talks a lot about the Masonic and Freemasonry, but let me get you to this part. All right. So this part right here. Now, if you research the history of Noble Drew Lee, right, or Timothy Drew, right, you see that there's no census records. There's no like they don't know. And the story is basically a story that he's the son of he has like three different parents, according to the three different uh, views on it. Right. And um, so one of them is that, you know, he's from the son of an adopted son of Cherokee slaves. So an adopted son of Cherokee slaves. So the son of a slave or an adopted son of a slave that ran away from his aunt after his mom died. All right. You know, we, we read the story before. We're going to go back into it again. And it, then he went and ran away and went in with the gypsies. They called the gypsies. But these were the what they were calling the tribe of Ishmael. These so-called gypsies were the tribe of Ishmael, with these like indentured uh, European servants. They had, um, you know, these Arab last name, Ishmael. Uh, so what was going on here? We're going to dig into that in other parts of this. We're going to dig into all this. I right, tribe of Ishmael and his connection with Drew Ali. But uh, I wanted to show this. This was, uh, I ran into this in, the, in another article on the internet, but I'm glad I found it here. It's in one place. All right. Because, um, yeah, his birth and all that's a mystery. So there's another thing here, theory. Well, not a theory. There's actually more uh, factual information about a real person named actually Thomas Drew. All right. So now I want to show you this card here. It says Professor Drew, the Egyptian Adept student. The Egyptian Adept student. Remember that, um, you know, he went to Egypt. Circle story. He went to Egypt. He found an ancient Egyptian mystic cult, an ancient priest there, gave him an initiation, blindfolded him, and then accepted him into his secret society. And then he came back and started doing everything he did, right? All right, so then remember, so they're calling this guy Professor Drew the Egyptian Adams, all right? According to the oral testimonies of members of Moorish science, Noble Drew Ali first began his teachings as Professor Drew, Egyptian Adams student and continued them through his organizing activities in the Canaanite temple. Although there is no date or citation available for the advertisement of Professor Drew, a World War I draft registration card from 12 September 1918 and the 1920 United States Census place a Thomas Drew, all right, Thomas Drew, at the same address, all right, at the same address, all right? While the first name Thomas conf conflicts with previous accounts of Drew Ali as Timothy Drew, the information from the draft cards and census records suggest otherwise. You got to go with the census. What does it say in your genealogy? Your census. The draft card from September 1918 reports that Thomas Drew was born 8 January 1886. This is the same year that Drew Ali was supposedly born. All right. This is a real person that they got here. 
has the same birth date, the same date followers and historian cite as his birthday, and also cites him as a Negro man of medium height and built with black hair. Ultimately, Drew was disqualified for service in the war because the muscles on his forearm were badly burned, badly burned. Just like the story of Drew Ali, how his aunt tried to burn him and Allah saved him. Remember, she, so he ran away, his wicked aunt. So this person, Thomas Drew, is badly burned. He wasn't qualified for uh, service in the war. So it says this physical feature of Drew Ali also parallels the uh, Morris Science Temple uh, father's stories of Drew's childhood. Their stories of his childhood, his, his childhood, right? Where he was cast into a fire by his aunt. The draft registration card also places Drew as a laborer for the submarine boat corporation in the port of New Jersey. As a laborer in the port, Drew would have come in con into contact with workers from different countries. So he was all around the world. Is that when he went into Egypt? Because he was in service. As the corporation at its peak employed 25,000 people. The census record from January 1920 confirms Thomas Drew's residence at 181 Warren Street, New Jersey. All right, Thomas Drew, 1920 census. The census lists Drew as a preacher on public streets. All right, who is this? Indicating that between September 1918 and January 1920, Drew had begun formulating some version of his religious movement. It is unclear what specific religious affiliation Drew had at this time, since the only early record that has survived is the advertisement of Professor Drew, Egyptian Adib student. Despite oral testimony that connects Drew to the Canaanite temple, there is no fur further evidence that tangibly connects his early religious efforts to the Canaanite temple. There is evidence on the advertisement for Professor Drew that he was always, already combining Islam with Christianity, as he states on the card, I am Muslim, and also indicates that he was the divine ability to interpret the Bible while also offering information about the last years of the life of Jesus. Jesus, we already got that, right? Research Abdul Hamid Suleiman, an Egyptian Muslim, reveals his organizing activities associated with the Canaanite temple and its connections to African-American Freemasonry Freemasonry again here we go this information about Suleiman's activities and the Canaanite temple suggests that noble Drew Ali and his creation of more science may have been influenced by the work of Suleiman religious scholar Patrick B. Bowen identified in an article Negro Freemasons Incorporate in the New Brunswick Times on February 4, uh, 4 February 1910 which reported the incorporation of Mecca Medina temple of ancient free and operative Masons in August 1922, Suleiman attended the African American Masonic Convention where he presented himself to Caesar R. Blake Jr., the leader of the ancient Ar Egyptian Arabic order, nobles of the mystic shrine. You hear this? All right. This was connected to the Egypt here. Also referred to as the Black Shriners. All right. And insisted that Shriners come under protection of Mecca Medina Temple, what he referred to as the True Shrine. These insights about Suleiman and his connection to the earlier forms of Masonic Islamic organizations further complicate the history of Noble Drew Ali and the creation of the Canaanite Temple in 1913. Both Mecca, Medina, and the Canaanite Temple may have been, as Bowen suggests, one of the many African American Masonic factions that had been springing up since 1894, inspired by rhetoric of the Black Shriner movement. Drew Ali may have been involved in the formation of the Canaanite Temple, but it seems that he previously documented timeline of 1913 is highly unlikely. Moreover, it was not until 1920 that Drew Ali formally associated himself as a preacher as documented in the 1920 census. Although it is not impossible that Drew had been involved in shaping the Canaanite Temple, his presence has not been documented in any sources related to the organization. All right. So check this out. So here's a newspaper article. Let me just try to zoom in. All right, it says, convert sought by Mohammedans make special drive among Negroes of US. Dr. Abdul Harstan Suleiman, a, pa a, a pastif, a native of Arabia of 143 West 103rd Street, Manhattan, the high priest of Mecca for a number of years has inaugurated a movement for, for spreading Mohammedan 
ism among the Negroes of the United States. A number of Muslim groups have been started, particularly one in Newark, New Jersey, under the name of the Canaanite Temple. Under their leadership, the temple, it is reported, has a, attracted a large membership group of Negro uh, Muslims have combined with the Turkish and Syrian groups throughout the United States. All right. Dr. Solomon has gathered together these groups with the Turkish and Syrian groups in this country, and they have decided to um, cre create a mosque in the northern part of Manhattan Island under the leadership of Dr. Suleiman. There will be a movement conducted among the Negro people throughout the United States to convert them to Mahometism. All right, so it says article discussing the early Canaanite temple. All right, so I think she's showing you for a reason. So what? Look what she's gonna say. So it says in the article of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle. This is from the Brooklyn Daily Eagle from the July fifteenth, nineteen twenty-three. All right, that article we just read it says the Canaanites Temple of Newark, New Jersey, was attributed to Dr. Suleiman. Says Drew Ali's involvement with the temple has been reported only in oral histories. While the spelling in this report does not match other historical documents on the Canaanite temple, the Associated Press often printed typos and spelling and punctuation errors. The article does not mention Drew Ali, only Dr. Suleiman. Bowen cited the activities of the Mecca Medina temple as early as 1910 and posited Suleiman's possible involvement with that group. The Broken Daily Eagle article states that this Suleiman was the leader of the Canaanite temple with other Muslim groups and he was the high priest of Mecca for a number of years. It is also announced that he has inaugurated new movement. So you see that article didn't even mention Novo Duali is what she's pointing out for the Canaanite temple. All right, so we're back in the book, The Craft and the Crescent. Freemasonry in the Black Muslim Movement in America by Michael Schneider. All right, so we just went to that article. They're talking about Freemasonry was a big part of that, right? They were linking a lot of people together. We were over here a little bit earlier talking about the United Negro uh, Improvement Association and Marcus Garvey, Noble Drew, founded by Noble Drew and Marcus Garvey, right? You remember that? So we went and found out that they actually were in the... Uh, uh, well, members Elijah Muhammad, Novo Juali of, of this organization. That says many group, many books have been written about each of the groups listed above. So I will not go into great deal of their general history. I have listed a selected reading page for further study. The Order of Freemasonry is the grandfather of all fraternal organizations and has some impact on each generation. Freemasonry has been segregated for most of its history in the United States, yet its impact on both black and white societies cannot be disputed. Many leaders of both races have been members of this organization, and the teachings of Freemasonry show in their actions. Freemasonry had filled in a need in two cultures of both black and white. African Americans have transformed Freemasonry into a social and religious sect that continues to be driving force in society today. All right, it says Marcus Garvey in the United Negro Improvement Association. All right, it tells the story. All right, so further down on this regarding Marcus Garvey, it says Marcus Garvey was a member of the Prince Hall Freemasonry. All right, Marcus Garvey was a member of Prince Hall Freemasonry. Back, let's go back to Africa, right? It was he, what he was saying all the time, right? Mary Lefkowitz states to a large extent that UNIA was organized along Masonic lines, it had a significant benevolent function. It had a constitution based on the Masons. It also had a potentate, and potentate's helmet closely resembled the ceremonial hat worn by Masons in special parades. Note the picture above the Marcus Garvey in a similar uniform to that of a Knights Templar of the Masonic Order. All right, so let's go back. You see, the time about his dress, the way he dressed, and all that. Many African-American Freemasons at the time believed that Freemasonry actually started in the advanced civilization of ancient Egypt. This helped African-Americans identify with Freemasonry as it was thought to be based on ceremonies in ancient Africa. One of the UNIA main doctrine was that black men should leave America and return to the homeland of Africa. You see, that's what Marcus Garvey was telling you. Go back to Africa. All right, Noble Drew in the Moorish Science Temple of America. A man named Timothy Drew, all right? So we just got his name was really Thomas Drew, all right? Thomas Drew. 
founded the Morris Science Temple in 1913. He was born in North Carolina on January 8th, 1886, right? Same date as the Thomas Drew, who actually has some census records. He converted to Islam after a visit to Saudi Arabia. Marcus Garvey and his group heavily influenced Drew, and after Garvey was deported in 1927, many of his followers joined Drew's organization, many of Garveyites, all right? Remember, they told us were leaders in the uh, Morris Science Temple. Many of the Garveyites were leaders in the Morris Science Temple. We got this reference in another source and in, the, in the last videos, all right? He took the name Noble Drew Ali and proclaimed himself a prophet of Allah, God. He was a member of the ancient Egyptian nobles of the mystic shrine, commonly called the Black Shriners. Noble Drew Ali, you know, ancient mason. The men in this uh, Morris Science Temple wore fezes as part of their dress. They were also required to wear colored shorts with elastic just below the knee and uniforms or robes of purple of red, which resembled those worn by the Shriners. They were considered to be Asiatic or Moors instead. Asiatic or Moors instead of African American, instead of Aboriginal, instead of the Aboriginal of America. He thought that the Moors were superior to the white race. Noble Drew Ali stated that Jesus, Jesus, according to the temple teaching as a black man tried to redeem the black Moabites, Moabite, Moabite, only to be executed by the white Romans. In their meeting, they would practice rites that were not to be spoken of outside of the order. You can't do this. Keep it a secret. They had their own marriage ceremonies that consisted of 30 members and were conducted by the divine minister. If they were to quit the order, they would be required to commit suicide according to the oath taken upon joining. Outside of their meetings would be placed a guard who would push a button that would turn on a light at the podium. This let the speaker know if some unwanted guests were coming. If so, they would changed their tone of speaking they had different colored lights for different occasions depending on whether or not they thought the visitor to be a government informer some of the titles of their officers are as follows grand sheik national counselor lieutenant governor sheik minister assistant grand sheik divine minister supreme grand advisor supreme grand governor they would carry membership cards with them at all times which consisted of the following this is your nationality an identification card for the Moorish Science Temple of America and birthright for the Moorish Americans, etc. We honor all the divine prophets, Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, Confucius, Buddha. May the blessings of God of our Father Allah be upon you that carry this card. I do hereby declare that you are a Muslim under the laws of the Holy Quran of Mecca. Love, truth and peace and freedom. I am a citizen of the USA. You're a citizen of the corporation, USA capital letters. Noble Drew Ali, the prophet one, one of his take with Chicago. So you see, that's the card. We read it in the other book too. They were required to learn an examination of question and answers to be part of the organization. This was taken from the examination portion of Freemasonry. Noble Drew Ali also wrote the Quran as revealed to him by Allah, containing the Moorish view of creation to the end of time and the fulfilling of prophecies. Ali's Quran focused on the history of the black man and his evolution to its current state. This Quran in no way resembles the Holy Quran used by practicing Muslims. After death, Ali, John Givens L claimed to be the new prophet and continued the organization. It is still in existence today, mainly in major cities. There have been several offshoots, mainly because of power struggles within the organization. All right. So uh, found this article. I guess it was was inscribed. All right. So, but I don't think it was always inscribed. A lot of uh, info in here esoteric and a lot of knowledgeable info actually too you know i'm not gonna front but you know we're just gonna see a perspective they got that's from this what i want to show you so this is called um so cm bay certificate number you know there's a number and more civic relation concepts bro taj Tariq bay all right and you see the more there's asia all right you see all the, the compass and all of the masonic symbols the handshake the brotherhood all right degrees of knowledge 360 right all right moore's order of the round table civic science heritage class all right zoom in a little bit and it says moore's the descendants of the ancient moabites moabites you are the ancient moabites all right 
So it's not just Sheik El Wei saying this. No, well, Drew Ali's been saying it and everybody else who was taught under him. All right, you are the descendants of the ancient Moabites. Really, is that so? You're a Moabite, Canaanite. So when you say we're all Moors, you're saying we're all Moabites. You know what I mean? So that's like generalizing, right? You know. So it says the true indigenous people who inhabited the northwestern and southwestern continents, lands of ancient Amexum. You know, this is their, you know, this is their whole story of, you know, this is what they call America. They call it Northwest and Southwest Africa. Uh, Amexum, Al Morocco, Al Morocco, now called the Americas, North, Central, South, and the adjoining islands. Through the reconstruction of historical writings, the dark period. These peoples and their lands have been renamed or branded to confuse the people concerning the true geographical location of their native lands, which are under European siege colonization. Moors are bound to the continents of the Americas by heritage and birthright. All right, so, so when they're saying Moors, uh, when they're talking about uh, ancient Moabites, or you know, or they're talking about dark-skinned people, you know, because they kind of always mix those two. All the time back and forth and so yes there were so-called negroes over here in america and that is this is their birthright yes all right so if that's what you mean then we can agree on that so it says a maxim here and it shows you know you've probably seen this in the internet uh it says northwest and south is a maxim along with the adjoining islands land of the moors the descendants of the ancient moabites you're a moabite you're from moab you're a moabite canaanite moabite that's where you are. In these contemporary times, a maxim is called America. All right. So it shows here, right? Northwest Africa, Southwest Africa. I mean, the word Africa didn't even exist. You know what I mean? It's not even supposed to exist back then. Like, you know. So they have all the lots. So you got all the lots now. So you had Ham's lot over there, then you got Shem's lot, Japheth's lot. You got all the lots, I guess, right? These are some of the names the Maxim has been called. It says Maxim, Mu, Marazzi, Moroc, Al Moroc, Northwest and Southwest Africa, North and South America. America is the prefix of Amexum and the suffix of Africa. But Africa didn't even exist back then. What do you mean? America, America, Al Moroc, American, Al Moroccan, Al Moroccan. Moorish American it says Moors, the descendants of Moroccans, and born in America. Again, Moors, the descendants of Moroccans, and born in America. Al Moroccans says Brother Taj Tariq Bey, Moor Order of the Round Table of Northwest of Maxim. All right, all right, so we're in this book right here called Conquistadors of the Red City, the Moroccan Conquest of the Songhai Empire by Comer Plummer III. And shout out to Treda Wakandan for the drop. He passed me this info on Instagram. Make sure you follow this brother. He got a lot of drop, a lot of knowledge, a lot of uh, receipts, a lot of proof, you know, a lot of research. So go follow the brother. He has a good Instagram page. He also has a, a YouTube, Treda Wakandan. Yeah. All right. So this is the book we're going to get into right now. So we're in page 55, just to get a little reference. So they're talking about Al Mansur, I guess he was the ruler of Morocco during a time when, uh, yeah, they were doing business and commerce with England, Queen Elizabeth. All right. So let me just start right here. It says, Meanwhile, Al Mansur also developed his diplomatic and commercial ties with England. This country offered a lifeline out from in between the Spanish Ottoman hammer and anvil predicament so see this uh the spaniards were allied with the ottomans and they had a lot of the, uh, power and you know going all around the world and doing conquests like in the americas especially right because this is in the 1500s we're talking about so the spanish already got the whole americas and the portuguese right and the ottoman it seems to have an alliance with them right so the morocco is trying to get an alliance with england all right so it says this Bergeronin relationship was also timely since the ransom money had dried up and the sugar receipts from London were indispensable to paying his army. As never before, the sugar was flowing out of Safi and Agadir, 
and the manufactured goods of London and beyond were pouring into Marrakesh. In 1582, the greater danger was passed. Spain was disengaging from North Africa, and the Turks appeared to have finally accepted Moroccan independence. While the Algerians remained a worrisome neighbor, the threat of foreign invasion appeared to be, at least for a time, over. Freed from such immediate concerns, Al-Mansur began to act upon his desires. Most of his musings were directed at the only foreign ruler he seemed to trust to any degree, Queen Elizabeth I of England. With her, he formed a Barbary trading company. So Al-Mansur, Morocco, right? formed the Barbary Trading Company with Queen Elizabeth, all right? The Barbary Trading Company with Queen Elizabeth, all right? Remember, this is before they went and settled that their colonies in the Americas. There's an alliance here before that, right? In exchange for sugar and saltpeter, she agreed to provide timber for a Moroccan fleet. On another occasion, Al-Mansur negotiated for her to build him 10 galleys. The two corresponded of an alliance against Spain. Against Spain. That means everything they own. So if Spain is in the Americas, right? If they got the whole Central America and the Caribbean and parts of South America uh, already invaded and con conquered, they mean they're going to go after them there. They plotted to support the candidacy of Don Antonio Prior of Cat Crato to the Portuguese throne, which Philip II of Spain had assumed in 1580. The Moroccan Sultan pledged to provide foodstuffs to an English force in an attack on Lisbon. Al-Mansur even went so far as to propose that Morocco and England divide Spain's New World colonies between them. Alright? You see what's going on? I'm trying to tell you. So Morocco had an alliance with England and they said, let's get together, right? And let's go take over and divide Spain's New World colonies between them, between them. All right, with Morocco taking off the more tropical varieties such as the West Indies, they were like, give us the West Indies, we like that. Given Moroccan expertise in sugar cultivation, who went to make plantations in the West Indies? Morocco. All right, they sent pirates, these privateers they call them, they were sending pirates to invade the Spanish ships. We went over this in my past videos, right? Who are these pirates? Remember, they draw them as parrots today because that meant Negro Loro or dark skinned Loro, a Loro, a Lora. That means parrot today. That's why they show you parrots because the pirates, these captains, a lot of them were Moors. They were the ones who knew how to sail the world. All right. They were pretty good at it. So they said, hey, fuck it. Let's get together. I got sugar, because Al-Mansur was growing sugar in Morocco, right? They have a lot of sugar exporting all over the world. They're like, fuck it. Give me the West Indies. I'll help you go against Spain, right? So I can go cultivate over there, all right? Given Moroccan expertise in sugar cultivation, he reasoned this would be appropriate. It was all very grand for a kingdom of land lubbers whose army was reliant on foreign soldiers and mercenaries mercenaries Ahmad al-Mansur's correspondence with Elizabeth went on until her death a few months before his own while the Queen's letters reflected diminishing expectations of al-Mansur's missives were unremittingly grandiose taken as a whole they are a catalog of wishful thinking all right they say wishful thinking but we know what's up because we're about to show you something all right so I just want to go to another page in this book so again, they had sugar, right? So it says Moroccan historian and statesman of Sajani, all right, reported that among the first things Sultan Al Mansur did after his great victory in the Sudan was to build sugar refineries like pyramids. According to Al Fishtali, Al Mansur built many sugar refineries in Haha Shishawa in the south of Morocco with gold from the Sudanese campaign and cheap labor. Black slaves obtained from the Sudan, it says, the Sultan must have been inspired to restart the sugar industry on a large scale, a lucrative product with a ready market in Europe. Al Ifrani died in the, the years, has reported that Italian marble was exchanged for Moroccan sugar weight for weight. Paul Berthier, drawn from primary sources that discussed the use of slave labor and sugar production, slave labor and sugar production, you see, they were good at this, identified a set of toponymous associated with the regions in which sugar was produced. Diur al-Abid, the house of slaves, and Radat al-Bid, cemetery of first slaves, 
all right you know these names the village of slaves look at this and al Asur, the aqueduct of slaves in shishawa in Sus, a largely berber speaking area berber the top toponym in close proximity to the sugar refinery of tassin Mord, was called agrum isam or something about slave right meaning the gathering place for slaves so they had, wherever they had their sugar plantations right in all these places al mansur right the moroccan dude right in morocco that's where they they said that's where the slaves was gathered because that's they were working the slaves there like plantations like like eventually happened in the west indies right like eventually happened in the west indies same system before right they had this already established in morocco spanish chronicler luis del marno carvajal noted that in the 1550s, the European captives were used in the Sus to produce sugar. European slaves appeared to be less numerous than enslaved black Africans. The sugar produced in these areas was of high quality and exported to European countries such as Italy and France, but especially to England. Because during this period, Morocco had an alliance with England. Almansur's foreign affairs with England under Queen Elizabeth were intriguing. After the initial commercial alliance, Queen Elizabeth was interested in a military collaboration with Almansur, a military collaboration with the Moors, England with the Moors. In a letter to Queen Elizabeth in 1601, Almansur proposed that Morocco and England together conquer the West Indies, expel the Spaniards, and occupy the land under a joint authority all right all right and this is exactly what was going on and we know this is history all right we know the english had war with the spanish we know the english were sending pirates invading spanish colonies we know this we've gone over this a lot right we know that the first so-called uh, Negroes that arrived in America in 1619 were actually taken from a Spanish ship. These were Indians taken from a Spanish ship. They were pirated by English so-called privateers. They were raiding the Spaniards. This is exactly what they were talking about. So again, it says, all right, Almansur proposed that Morocco and England together conquered the West Indies, all right, expel the Spaniards and occupy the land under a joint authority. The queen was well disposed to attack the Spaniards in their colonies. Oh, yeah, we could do it over there, but not in their homeland. Yeah, let's go to war with them over there in the Americas. Consequently, she asked the Sultan of Morocco to provide 100,000 pounds for the joint scheme. Al-Mansur envisioned the occupation of the West Indies in the following letter that he wrote to the queen. Besides, we must treat of your army and of your our army. We shall go to those countries of people in the land. After that, with the help of God, we shall have subdued it. So they're talking about go take, go into here, coming here to America and taking your land, so-called Negro Aboriginal. And they say with the help of God. So they're saying Morocco and England. We shall have subdued it, subdue it. For our intent is not only to enter upon the land to sack it, it's not just that we're going to sack it and leave it, but we're going to possess it and that it remain under our dominion forever. Our dominion forever. We're going to make sure that these so-called Negroes never know this is their land. We're going to make sure. We're not just going to sack it and leave it. We're going to stay here. We're going to possess it forever under our dominion, Morocco and England, by the help of God, he says, to join it to our state and yours. And therefore it shall be needful for us to treat the people in thereof, whether it be your pleasure, it shall be inhabited by our army of yours, or whether we shall take it on our chart to inha inhabit it with our army without yours. In respect of the great heat of the climate, where those of your country do not uh, find themselves fit to endure the extremity of heat there and of the cold of your party parts where our men endure it very well by reason that the heat hurts them not so that he wants the hot parts that's what he's saying the letter continues to emphasize that this will be a joint venture in which the two parties will equally share in the profits of the west indies in the profits of the west indies tobacco sugar cocoa everything by dividing it so that every party would know its share, the letter 
calls the queen's attention to the benefit of such an alliance by stating, in your highest state shall know that in the inhabitant of those countries by us and you, you shall have a great benefit. First for that those countries of the East are joining to many King Moors and infinite nations of our religion. And further, if your power and command shall be seen there with our army, all the Moors will join and confederate themselves and confederate themselves. All the Moors will join by the help of God with us and you. Morocco and England. So it says, coincidentally, both rulers died in 1603. And their alliance regarding the colonization of West Indies did not materialize. All right, now this book go goes on to say that, you know, they both died in 1603, right? Well, so it's so funny how, you know, right after this, they colonized America, right? So James the first, right? All right, so King James. But anyways, they say that the alliance regarding, you know, the colonization of West Indies did not materialize, so it didn't happen. But, you know, just look at history and, you know, what I've been showing you in all the other very videos, you know, we know how to dodge the hijack because we're about to show you something, you know. What is the great seal of the United States according to a Moor? We're going to get into that, right? So we're talking about uh, Confederate, right? What he just said here, we're talking about all the Moors might join and confederate themselves. Confederate. All right. All right. So we're back in this article. Again, CM based certificate of more civic relation concepts. So There's a major part of this civic booklet focuses on CM based copyright certificate. All right. So this is his work. All right. It's not mine. This is his work, which is registered in Washington, District of Columbia Library of Congress Copyright Office. It has been prepared for Morris Order of the Round Table, study classes, and those who decide to protect the Morris Nation from unlawful abuses. Now it says, Trust in a, to assist the Morris Nation. This booklet, one of his series, is presented with, with love and sincere determination for the good. All right. Since truth needs no apology, fear not. The Moors must study and learn to operate in their sovereign capacity. Ergo, great seal, working for the justice land for all Moors Americans. And then you got all your symbols here. All right. All right. So I want to show this as the Constitution of the United States is the law of the land with all the treaties in force. Treaties. These are the instruments of law used to gauge and educate any matters of violation, controversy, or infringement between the Moors and the foreign European Christians. Between the Moors, who are the Moabites, Moroccans, and European Christians, who are the English? The United States has a dual nation, national seal, two sides of, the, of one seal. The Great Pyramid on the back of the U.S. dollar bill is the emblem of the Asiatic Moabite, Asiatic Moabite Moorish nation. The pyramid with the all C and I, that's the Moabite with the all C and I, the pyramid. The ancient ones, the master builders of civilization, mothers and fathers of the human family. The key word to distinguish the two seals is of. The seal of the United States of America, the European colonies, that says the other side, says the eagle wing spread with hexalpha, the insignia of the Moorish nation, dual trine, Solomon's shield, crowning its head. Hexalpha represents the red fez of the Moors, the tiara crown of Tarbush, sovereign authority. The sun never rises or sets in the Roman Empire, simply because they, the Romans, are in jurisdictional and resource possession, colonization of the fallen Moorish Empire, the al Morocks, Americas, they say, the land of the Moors. The great Masonic secret is the loss of the Moorish nations, consciousness, heritage, and birthrights. This explains the truth behind the duality of the United States' great seal. Now Rome wears the royal crown in the fez, and it seems because of the Treaty of 1787, all right? As the Treaty of 1787 is the law of the land, just as the Constitution and is binding on all the judges of every state. Look at them as one document as far as law and authority is concerned. It says Moors are not citizens of the United States society, but are the people of the continental United States being part and parcel of the government to which the Union of States are obligated. The constitutions of the two nations in conjunction with treaties with the treaties are the working tools for adjudication and jurisdictional arguments, procedures, and venue. Keep in mind the duality of the great seal of the United States. All right, I'm telling you again, there's two nations, the Moors and the European colonists, he's saying. 
and look, they're part of the government, part and parcel of the government. I mean, if you can interpret this on your own way, help me out. Because this is, I don't know, it just seems like, just some, like it just seems like you're part of the, the corporation. Like you're, 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 you're admitting you're part of the, the created government, the created corporation. So it's the Great Pyramid, the Great Seal, and Hexalpha. The Great Pyramid, Great Seal is the emblem of the Moorish nation. This is the emblem of the Moorish nation. You all see an eye at the top of the pyramid. And then we got the, uh, well, this also looks like the Jewish star, right? Star David or Hebrew symbol. But it says the Hexalpha is the insignia of the Moorish nation. All right. The symbol of the eye is Allah. The symbol of the pyramid is self. I am the first mo monad manifest in flesh and in balance. The first people of the earth, the Moabite Moabite Moorish nation, the Moabite. So now we're all Moabites. Asiatics and Muslims, the Moabite Asiatics and Muslims. Where's the Amaru Khan? Amara Kapana, the plum serpent. Hexalpha, the dual trine, represents the law of duality, as above, so below. The spiritual and the physical, the mother and son, the mother and son. Hexalpha is sometimes displayed within the fertile crescent, mother and nation. All right, so. If you haven't watched my Thoughts videos, go ahead and go watch part one and part two, because part three is going to be really crazy. I'm going to break all this down. All these symbols, you know, they come out of, you know, even from, you know, Thoth, way back from Thoth and all that Egypt, ancient mystery schools, all that. So, um, and, and again, where did the word coming from? Amaraka. Because Thoth in his emerald tablets, right? What he's saying, he's from Atlantis, right? Atlantis, that was over here, right? Moors know that. Right? Then the Moabite Moors occupy Atlantis. That was over here. Oh, mean that was you, you mean? Oh, wait, that was your ancestor? Is that what you're telling me, Toph? Where you, you guys kind of have the same. All right. What does Islam, you know, have to do with Queen Elizabeth? What does it have to do with the Moorish nation? Right? What does it have to do with Christianity? All this is going to be, you know, future videos, you know. But, you know, let's just, just enjoy the journey for now. And, uh, you know, if y'all can put your, your input on it, I'll love it in the comments, you know, whatever information you have, you know, we can start putting this together, all of us. All right. So now it says, again, we're in there. This is their teaching. So we're learning their perspective, right? So it says, Hexalpha, the dual trines, dual trines, the trine, triunes, also represent the centrifugal and centripetal forces in nature called yin and yang. Yep, you see the two triangles? They put it together. Yeah, we know that most of Yep. All right, we can dig that, right? And then check this out. Self, I, self, law, and master. You yourself are the law and master. What's up with Hawa? These are the five universal symbols of Islam. The 12 signs of the Zodiac, the signs of the Moorish nation of the order of Islam. North Gate, North America, founders of civilization. The North Gate. Moorish nationals, initiates, and doctors of law in general should be co cognizant of the fact that the preamble of the Constitution of the United States of America has two entities, United States. The two, en the two entities referred to in the preamble are the first, an entity, the United States, symbolized the Great Seal, and the second entity, the United States of America, symbolized by the eagle in flight, Phoenix Bird, which came out of the ashes fall of the Moabite, Moabite, Moorish Empire, the great lost estate. The great lost, you mean Atlantis when it fell? The great lost estate? What were you guys doing in Atlantis? What's the stories of Atlantis that they tell us the people were living wrong or something, right? They did something to cause that, right? The Moabite Moorish nation was overthrown by the Franks Franciscan Brotherhood, Moabite. The negative economic and social conditions of the descendants of the Moorish nation, labeled Negro, black, colored, is because the Moors are war booty and prisoners of war in their own lands we can dig that the, the so-called couple colored tribes of america the aboriginal yeah he is a prisoner of war in his own land all right we didn't call it almo rocks though the hex alpha displayed in glory over the head of the eagle and the seal of the united states of america indicates their facto trusteeship the facto trusteeship over the great Maghreb, morocco over the great morocco the trusteeship that sealed the deal all right the seals the deal we see it. it sealed the deal. All right. Al Mansur and Queen Elizabeth were plotting it. I'll set up my 
plantations. You get the north. You got the tobacco. We'll take all that. We'll do it. All right. Who's to say that and carry on? And you can see that even they're kind of hinting to us right now, right? There's a duo that the facto trusteeship over the great Maghreb, Morocco, far west. Much of the true history and culture of the Moorish nation is preserved and taught in the Masonic lodges and secret societies of North America and the world. All right. We, the people of the United States, are the people of the land, says the indigenous sovereign people of the Al Moroccs of Amaracapana who inhabited the northwestern and southwestern shores of Africa. Al Moroccs, so they're calling here Africa, right? The Americas run from Alaska to Argentina, Patagonia, including the adjoining islands. These are the descendants of the ancient Moabites, again. So all the people from Alaska to Argentina are all Moabites. The Moors, all they're all Moabites. That's it. That's all you got. That, that's it. Everybody's a Moabite. The Great Seal is the emblem of the Moorish nation. The Great Seal, the pyramid with the eye. These people from the north to south are all Al Moroccans. The Americans. North, South, and Central. This is the first party entity in the preamble of the Constitution. All right, so that's the first party. But they're all Moabites. All right. The preamble of the Constitution of the United States of America shows that the origin comes from pre existing nation. This is the secret of nature's law and nature's God, symbolizing the two seals of the one great seal of the United States, the continental United States of the indigenous Moorish nation. Nature's law and nature's God is mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. Now it says here, pay attention, the great seal of the United States, Moabites, Moors, federal. That's the federal, the Moabites and the Moors are the federal. And then it says one union with the seal of the United States of America, the corporation of Albion's Europeans, colony states. Isn't that what Al Mansour and Queen Elizabeth were talking about? That's exactly what they were talking about. One union. All right. The Moabites and the Albion's Europeans. One union. Who was the first colonist, really? Who was these first presidents, these first? All right. Were they really white? Were they Moors? Moabites. Were all of them European Albions? A uniting or connecting of two or more into one. It says a union. This can represent chemicals, principles, or peoples. Peoples uniting, uniting into one. Peoples. Who? Moabite Moors with the Albion Europeans. Where's the Amaru Khan? This can represent peoples. An example in simple form is one plus one equals two. In the secret history of the West, the two seals of the United States represent the union between the Moorish Muslims and European Christians into a government based on the ancient and illustrious principles of the five-pointed star. The five-pointed star? Love, truth, peace, freedom, and justice as established in the ancient civilization of Mu. The ancient Moabites law of peace. These principles are founded in nature's law and nature's God mentioned in the unanimous declaration of independence. Nature's law is sometimes referred to as the wheels in the sky, the great zodiac constellation, universal law of peace. So it's here the national flag of the Moabite Moorish nation of North America, North Gate. So that's the North Gate. It says the old glorious red flag with a five pointed green star in the center. The flag of the Moorish Al Moroccan Americans, so the direct descendants of the ancient Moabites, who inhabited the northwestern and southwestern shores of Africa and Mexican. The word Al is Moorish land for descendant of or coming down from. All right. And it tells you. It says the green star is the ang angle, angel, Ishtar, descended to the earth, Ishtar, Astarte, also called Astarte Venus. Really? You guys got a starty in your flag? An angel. Fallen one or what? Ishtar? Like Easter? Like the Christians celebrate Easter, right? We know that started from a starty. Right? And you guys got that on the flag? Venus. Venus is the most brilliant star in our solar system. Her Elohim identity is Anna L. Her degree days is Friday. All right, so. Let me just show you this the crescent and the star 
is a red flag with a white crescent star in the center. The star is just inside the upper horn of the crescent. The crescent star is the oldest flag in all human history. It is mother to all other flags of the nations. It symbolizes mother and son. Mother and son. Like Mary and Jesus. In a singular form, it symbolizes the cosmos. So the crescent is a symbol of the angel. Angle, angel, the angle, right? Angel, messenger, Luna, the moon, the moon, Elohim. Identity is Gabriel. All right. Again, if you guys go watch my thought videos, who was Gabriel really? Who was Gabriel really? Gabriel. Why did he appear to Mary? Talking about Jesus was coming. Then he also appeared to Muhammad and made him write down the Quran. It was Gabriel who recited the Quran to Muhammad. Gabriel, the same one that appeared to Mary, his messenger. He's very involved in a lot of things, especially in religion. Gabriel, go watch my thought videos. So you got Gabriel and East Easter Venus. And, you know, you're representing both that. All right. Okay. Thank you.